Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Heritage Foundation's president, Kay Coles James. Good afternoon. I am so delighted to see so many good friends. And uh, it's going to be a great afternoon. So wonderful to see you all here. Hi, Dee. Hi, Ashley. We are so delighted that you're here. I want to take a minute before we get started to introduce uh, and talk to you a little bit about uh, why I care so much about this Jay Parker lecture, why it's important to us here at the Heritage Foundation. On a very personal level, I am indebted to Jay. Many of you know him as the father of the modern-day black conservative movement. I, in fact, know him as that as well, but he was also a dear friend and a mentor. Anyone who knew him well could stand here today and share stories about Jay, and the lessons they learned, um, and uh, how he impacted their lives. But uh, for those of you who didn't know him that way, Jay led the Lincoln Institute for Education and Research that brought together great black conservative intellectuals like Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams and Anne Wortham. Jay worked to advance the ideals of limited government, individual freedom, and a society that judged men and women on the basis of their individual merit and not based on race, religion, or ethnic background. He had such a powerful and lasting impact on America that Justice Clarence Thomas credited him for his seat on the Supreme Court. Also, as I mentioned earlier today, the Heritage Foundation and the Gloucester Institute have the distinct honor of hosting Jay's wife, Dolores, and daughter, Ashley. On behalf of those of us in this room and on behalf of the entire conservative movement, I want to thank you both so much for sharing your dear husband and your father with us for all those years. Our nation is better off today because of it. Thank you for being here. Please stand. As we are fond of saying, we love you to the moon and back. So the legacy of Jay Parker and picking speakers that can sort of embody that uh, was sort of an easy choice this year. And so today we have the privilege of having with us Judge Janice Rogers Brown. She recently retired after serving our country for 12 years on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District uh, of D.C. Circuit. For those of you who don't know, the D.C. Circuit is considered among the most powerful courts in the nation second only to the Supreme Court. Even before her time on the bench, she was known as a principled conservative who always stood her ground. If you need proof, look no further than the congressional Democrats who filibustered and stalled her confirmation for two whole years. She dared to hold the radical view that the Constitution meant what the Constitution said. She bravely checked the outsized power of the federal government. One of her former law clerks said that her dissents stressed that just because a government agency thought something was a good idea didn't mean it was necessarily lawful. And in an act of selflessness, a quality that's sort of hard to come by in this town sometimes, she put the nation's interest above her own and retired from the bench in 2017 to allow President Trump to appoint another conservative in the D.C. Circuit. But if you know Janice, then you know that even in her retirement, she continues to serve her country. She's the chairman of the board of the New Civil Liberties Alliance. She's on the board of regents of Pepperdine University, and she's a member of the board of the Coolidge Foundation. And she's a fellow here at the Heritage Foundation. Janice and I have known each other for decades. And I can tell you without reservation that she is one of the most inspiring, compassionate, 
and no-nonsense leaders I've ever met. I'm thrilled to introduce you to a woman who is the standard by which federal judges should be measured. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming an American patriot and my dear friend, Judge Janice Rogers Brown. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to Dolores and Ashley. It's wonderful to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. <laughs> um, it's very good to be here to see so many people here to honor the legacy of Jay Parker. Um, I am so pleased that the Heritage Foundation has created a lectureship to honor a man who dedicated his life to defending American ideals, and ensuring that rising generations would learn to cherish freedom. My husband and Jay shared the same surname. Uh, from their first meeting, and on every occasion thereafter, Jay would ask about the condition of the family trust fund. <laughs> <laughs> and he always seemed a bit suspicious of the accounting when Dewey said he had no knowledge of it. <laughs> Um, Jay loved his jokes, and he never tired of that one. Um, they shared another similarity. I think they own two of the brightest smiles I have ever encountered. Many people purport to be happy warriors, but Jay Parker, James Andrew, which I just found out, <laughs> really was one. And back in uh, 2007, Jay invited me to speak at uh, the Lincoln Club. Um, and on that occasion, my subject was the politics of compassion. And looking at the world now, it seems startling that such profound seismic shifts could occur in a little more than a decade. Um, and the truth is, they didn't. We just think that's what happened. <laughs> then, Bill Clinton was still president, and the possible election of the second black president seemed to portend a new age of racial amity in America. Indeed, we now know it was merely a prelude to days of rage, incendiary identity politics, a shrill and vicious incoherence, and lethal petulance in response to imaginary affronts. There is a question here. One conservatism needs to answer. Why is it that the audacity of hope is invariably overwhelmed by the velocity of despair. So last time I did this uh, speech for Jay, I started uh, with a poem. It's really a song. Um, but I can't sing, so I'm going to do it <laughs> as a poem. Um, it, it's a riff by Oscar Brown Jr. that I first heard at a very impressionable age. Uh, and it goes like this. On her way to work one morning, down the path alongside the lake, a tender-hearted woman saw a poor half-frozen snake. His pretty colored skin had been all frosted with the dew. Poor thing, she cried, I'll take you in and I'll take care of you. To make a long story short, she does that. She treats him very tenderly, puts him by the fire, uh, gives him milk, uh, puts him in a comforter of silk. And she comes back. Uh, after work, and she finds that snake has been revised. And she picks him up, she clutches him to her bosom. bosom. You're so beautiful, she cried. But if I hadn't brought you in, by now you might have died. She stroked his pretty skin and kissed and held him tight. Instead of saying thanks, that snake gave her a vicious bite. I saved you, cried the woman, and now you've bitten me, but why? You know your bite is poisonous, and now I'm going to die. Ah, oh, shut up, silly woman, said the snake with an evil grin. You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. <laughs> so I heard Oscar Brown Jr. sing that song when I was 18. He performed live at the public college I attended, and it made an indelible impression on me. But as 18-year-olds are wont to do, I saw only its romantic connotation. 
I thought it was about the fecklessness of the male of the species. Yes, I did. <laughs> and since it appears on an album by OBJ called The Battle of the Sexes, that is certainly one way to interpret it. But by the date of my Lincoln Club speech, I had come to understand it might serve as a political parable. Now, I think it is an even deeper allegory than I imagined. Like most good poetry, the snake is a story that works on many levels. One theme we might draw from it is that the things we hug to our bosoms do not change their essential nature simply because we mean well. Ideas have consequences, so do actions, and the consequences may be fatal. I want to advance here a theory, not entirely novel, about what is going wrong with our political life. At the end of World War II, Hannah Arendt contemplated the banality of evil. In the 21st century, the greatest threat may be the fatuity of benevolence. If you think, as the founder said, that governments are instituted among men to protect the inalienable rights of free, independent moral beings, you would draft a constitution of conscience, not to empower democracy, but to secure and defend individual liberty. If you believe, as modern progressives do, that the point of the governmental project is to eliminate material privation, you would implement a politics of compassion to expand government using democracy to create a kleptocracy. Tocqueville recognized a part of this dynamic when he spoke out against the revolutionary fervor of 1848, the first broadly socialist revolution in Europe, warning that socialism challenged civilization's very foundation and noting that it was nothing less than a new road to servitude because it makes the state the sole owner of property, unleashes man's cruelest material passions, and shows a deep distrust of liberty, of human reason, a profound scorn for the individual in his own right. He, however, saw democracy as the antidote. He said, democracy attaches all possible value to each man. Socialism makes each man a mere agent, a mere number. Democracy and socialism have nothing in common but one word, equality. But notice the difference. While democracy seeks equality in liberty, socialism seeks equality in restraint and servitude. He was not quite prescient. He did not perceive how the collectivist impulse would deform democracy. Like Tocqueville, most American conservatives have tended to view democracy as a monolithic good. But things are not that simple. In the aftermath of the Civil War, Orestes Bronson, a little known and often neglected legal thinker, eloquently articulates the constrained vision of Republican democracy. Brownson's biography makes him seem surprisingly modern. Beginning in the 1820s and continuing into the 1840s, Brownson was various, variously a Congregationalist, a Unitarian, and an atheist who flirted with all the isms of the left. He was, as Arthur Schlesinger Jr. once quipped, a Marxist before Marx. In his last book, The American Republic, published in 1865 when the country was struggling with reconstruction, Brownson articulates a vision of how democracy and Republican constitutionalism might be reconciled. First, he says, a humane political order must be reflective of a people's history as well as their deeper cultural, philosophical, and theological assumptions. Every written constitution is preceded by an unwritten constitution found in the nation's political culture, mores, customs, dispositions, and peculiar talents. The written constitution cannot be understood or interpreted without reference to the unwritten constitution. Secondly, Brownson warns of two equally destructive democratic errors. Um, the first, he said, is to assume that the Constitution contemplated pure democracy and that a shift to a purely popular basis is what is needed. That move, he said, would change the Constitution from republican to despotic or from civilized to a barbaric Constitution. It's a very interesting idea. Um, he says this notion of personal democracy, the so-called sovereign democracy, to which the South was committed before the war, emphasized individualism and identified liberty with power. He says the realization of this notion of democracy would make every person an absolute despot. In contrast to that, there was the humanitarian democracy, which was the preference of Northern abolitionists. 
that sounds good. Um, but his criticism is that it effaces all individualities and exaggerates the social element and sees humanity as superior to individuals, states, governments, and laws. While he thought personal democracy ceased to be a danger when the Confederacy was defeated, humanitarian democracy emerged from the war stronger than ever. And Brownson believed that humanitarian impulse was more dangerous than egoism. The humanitarians seem to be building on a broader and deeper foundation, being more Christian, more philosophic, more general, generous, and philanthropic. But he says, Satan is never more successful than under the guise of an angel of light. <laughs> Jay Parker seems to have understood this at an early age. He rejected black liberation theology when he was a precocious adolescent. He says, quote, I view the social gospel and God is dead movement in the latter half of the 20th century as a precursor to the demolition of standards in much of our society. He added, only God grants our individual freedom and it is up to man simply not to take it away. Brownson's perspective, I think, has some explanatory power. He sees that both of these strains of democracy that he's been describing are hostile to civilization, tending to destroy the state and capable of sustaining government only on principles, quote, common to all despotisms. In this century, both democratic eras have merged into a toxic amalgam that gives rise to such disparate phenomena as sanctuary cities, safetyism, radical autonomy, claims of microaggression, justifications for macro censorship, morality dictated by mob rule, and Antifa. Unfortunately, conservative criticism of democracy often begins and ends with complaints about the fairness of tax policy. This is not an insignificant argument. It is a grievous mistake to view the state as a neutral and benign tool. Once you allow the state to buy consent to exercise power, the amount of redistribution must always increase to extract the maximum amount that can be redistributed. Civil society, once it grows addicted to redistribution, changes its character and comes to require the state to feed its habit continually. Ironically, the government dependency eventually grows so great no amount of expropriation can pay the bill. You might consider here some of the proposals of uh, Democratic candidates of late. As D. Just Say puts it, perhaps facetiously, there is in competitive Democratic politics always a latent propensity for totalitarian transformation. But the devaluation of each man is only where the impulse begins, not where it ends. It makes no difference whether those who set the rules offer a permissive cornucopia or impose a coercive utopia. Frank Meyer offers this insight, quote, the philosophical essence of the whole intellectual movement of the last century has been the concept of control, of power, as surely in collectivist liberalism as in Marxism. For the project to succeed, human beings must cease to be independent centers of free will and become either cells in a social organism or an inchoate collection of atoms. Then the political power of the state can be used to direct them. It can be used directly and brutally, as in the Bolshevik Revolution, or indirectly and subtly, as in the Roosevelt Resolution, but the revolution, but the result is the same. As Rizard Laguto explains, both sides, communist and liberal democratic, share their dislike, sometimes bordering on hatred toward the same enemies, the church and religion, the nation, classical metaphysics, moral conservatism. And both sides desire a better world so badly that they do not hesitate to control the totality of human life. In other words, the brooding benevolence of the per permissive cornucopia is only permissive to its favored victims. On those inclined to resist its coercive call to compassion, it will not hesitate to use the whip to scourge with fire and sword or its modern equivalents, the FBI or the IRS. Control in the economic realm is deemed acceptable because the politics of compassion is a low-rent version of Marxism or democratic socialism. 
It rests on the same fallacies that have driven the debate for at least 100 years, that the only way to secure human rights is to abolish poverty, and that differences in wealth are caused by capitalism, which is a blight on the hope of humanity that must be abolished. Decades of empirical evidence contradict the latter proposition, but the idea that poverty is the fulcrum on which all discussions about human rights turns is pernicious. Such an idea is useful, as Ravel notes, only if we aim to make the fight for human rights a political weapon, an instrument of propaganda to use only when it serves our side or our point of view. We are often quick to acknowledge that American values cannot be imposed on other cultures. The question we now face is whether American values can be retained by an America that has itself become a foreign culture. We are, alas, following the path of every other liberal Western democracy, and perhaps that is inevitable. There is a growing consensus, and experience seems to bear it out, that liberal democracies and communist regimes are linked by common, common principles and ideas. Laguto posits that communism and liberalism and liberal democracy stem from the same histro historical roots in early modernity and often exhibit a propensity toward a cult of technology, an easy acceptance of social engineering as the proper means of reforming society, changing human behavior, and solving social problems. To blame technology makes the problem seem modern. But as Laguto reminds us, the word technology comes from the Greek techne, the gift Prometheus gave to the human race. According to the myth, his miraculous gift enabled people to make their lives better, but it had a dark side. By making men equal to the gods, it drew them into the sin of hubris. C.S. Lewis, in one of my favorite books, The Abolition of Man, insists that, quote, a dogmatic belief in objective value is necessary to the very idea of a rule that is not tyranny or an obedience that is not slavery. The objective value Lewis identifies is practical reason or objective truth. Virtue, he says, consists of loving, not merely knowing what is good and true and beautiful. Proceeding down the path of moral subjectivism will destroy our society, he warns. The practical consequences are far-reaching. And this is important. Um, this was written back in 1944. He says, in such a world, education and propaganda become one and the same. So too do legitimate rule and tyranny. Duty and goodness cease to exist, and man becomes whatever his appetites and passions make him. Abolition was written in 1944, and it must have seemed wildly exaggerated. Now, of course, it is merely prophetic. Something has gone terribly wrong. The common humanity identity politics of the civil rights era has been superseded by the virulent common enemy identity politics of today's progressives. The political correctness encouraged by good manners has become a stifling orthodoxy. Speech codes have morphed into full-scale riots where students at elite schools threaten and badger administrators and faculty while claiming physical assaults on unpopular speakers are justifiable self-defense. In February 2017, protesters converged on UC Berkeley to prevent Milo Yiannopoulos from speaking. They clubbed, beat, and maced counter-protesters and people who had come to hear the speech. An essay that appeared in the main student newspaper the next day is illuminating and chilling. Uh, it says, quote, if you condemn the actions that shut down Yiannopoulos' literal hate speech, you condone his presence, his actions, and his ideas. You care more about broken windows than broken bodies. I can't impeach Trump. I can only fight tooth and nail for the right to exist. So it's time for those waiting in the center to pick a side. As Jonathan Haidt notes, the author of the Berkeley essay provides a perfect example of the mental illness now being amplified by a university education. Catastrophizing, dichotomous thinking, and other cognitive distortions, i.e., if Milo speaks, there will be broken bodies on my side. I will lose my right to exist. If you condemn my violence, you condone his ideas. Solzhenitsyn famously said, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. Not the view of the new cognitive elite, 
For them, life is a battle between good people and evil people, and those who do not agree with the flamethrowers are evil people. Prior to the 2016 election, America had a cherished tradition of peacefully transferring power. No riots in the street, no military coups. George Washington himself set the standard. However, we now know elections have consequences only when the correct candidate is elected. Dubbing themselves the resistance, apparently with no sense of irony and perhaps unaware that they were doing exactly what the White Citizens Council did when the decision in Brown v. the Board of Education was announced, the disappointed of 2016 declared Trump was not their president. I am old enough to remember the black bumper stickers with white lettering that said, resist. The rioters that took to the streets to prevent a tiny black girl from entering the San Jose precincts of Little Rock's white elementary school and the public officials who blocked the doorways. The resistance and its interim tactics is not new. And long before the era of civil rights, Abraham Lincoln decried the mobocratic spirit he feared would, would destroy the republic, that last best hope of earth. Alas, recent events have taught the mob that violence, viciousness, bullying, and intimidation work. The relentless advance of social media has given mob tactics a heft and power they lacked in Lincoln's day. Hounding people out of restaurants and theaters while taking selfies or self-directed videos is proof of virtue. Oh, how fearless are the herd of SJWs willing to shatter the peace of the defenseless to garner the accolades of like-minded media mavens. Better yet, the failure of innumerable unwoke deplorables to meet an escalating series of impossible demands is reason enough to ratchet up the cruelties imposed on them by the anointed. Those who dismiss tra traditional morality and religious dogma now demand that everyone genuflect before a new form of morality based on compassion for women, gays, people of different and racial backgrounds, and those who are trans. As Douglas Murray explains, to fight for these marginalized groups and extol their cause is the new religion, a religion bolstered by a liberal dogmatism a metaphysics that a new generation is imbibing and everyone else is being force fed that expresses certainty about things we do not know and is wildly dismissive and relativistic about things we actually do know. While Murray applauds the expansion of anti-discrimination agendas, he is honest enough to acknowledge that the path SJWs have taken is not just unworkable, but dementing, making demands that are impossible toward ends that are unachievable. He quotes mathematician, mathematician Eric Weinstein's observation that the woke stuff that millennials and others are presently using to tear apart millennia of oppression and or civilization was all made up about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> the hideous and innate contradictions of enemy-making identity politics, hierarchies of victimhood, and intersectionality will not derail the social justice juggernaut. If logical consistency mattered, that train would never have left the station. Murray points out that contradiction is not enough because nothing about the intersectional social justice movement suggests it is interested in solving any of the problems it claims to be interested in. The first clue is the partial, biased, unrepresentative, and unfair depiction of Western societies. Few people think that a country cannot be improved on, but to present it as riddled with bigotry, hatred, and oppression is at best a partial and at worst a nakedly hostile prism through which to view society. It is an analysis expressed not in the manner of a critic hoping to improve, but as an enemy eager to destroy. There are signs of this intention everywhere we look. A cynic might echo Ravel's rueful, rueful observation, were the American melting pot so cruel a mirage, we would expect to see disillusioned hordes abandoning the USA for Albania, Slovakia, and Nicaragua. And now we could add Venezuela. I return now to the image with which I began this discussion, the snake. 
What is the nature of the serpent whose beauty enthralls us and blinds us to the likely consequences of holding it so tight? Perhaps it is our quest for absolute liberty, our need to challenge every restraint, to go beyond the ultimate questions, to conquer nature, even natural law. A serpent is a potent symbol and one that plays a pivotal role in some of our best stories, like the story of the Garden of Eden and the fall, you know, where the woman messes everything up. <laughs> our first encounter with the serpent was meant to teach us something vitally important, humility, a healthy respect for our own limits, including the limits of what we can question. Liberty is hard. Free government is not inevitable. It is only a possibility, a possibility that can be fully realized only when the polity is generally governed by the recognized imperatives of the universal moral law. It requires self-control, self-restraint, people capable of understanding that, in Lord Acton's words, liberty is not the power of doing what we like, but the right of being able to do what we ought. Jay Parker provides a wonderful example of the kind of character freedom requires. Though he dined with presidents and hobnobbed with prime ministers, he never sought the limelight. He acted on principle with integrity. He knew what he believed, had the courage of his convictions. He spoke the truth without flinching and never responded to the invective hurled his way with rage or rancor. He never responded at all. He argued for limited government and he spent his life volunteering and helping to lead the National Guard, the Salvation Army, the Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind, Goodwill, Gallaudet University, the Easter Seal Society, and the Kiwanis, to name only a few. Volunteering, using his own time, money, and resources to make the community better had the added benefit of teaching us not to expect too much from politics. It is not unimportant, but neither is it all important. It cannot be the source of meaning in our lives. Theodore Dostoevsky tells us beauty will save the world. This is so, he seems to say, because truth, beauty, reason, and the good form a unity which cannot be severed. Lezek Kolakowski seems to capture some sense of this when he invokes St. Augustine's poetic trope in The City of God, recalling how God enriches history by the same kind of antithesis that gives beauty to poetry. He says, there is beauty in the composition of the world's history arising from the antithesis of contraries, a kind of eloquence in events instead of words. Thus, he concludes, the devil often tries with great success to convert good to evil, but the battle is never ceded to him. God, Kolakowski says, may reforge evil, havoc, and destruction into instruments of his own design. That is reason enough to declare, as Jay Parker did, that some things are worth defending regardless of the cost. We too should defend first principles, just as Jay did to the last breath, and we should pray without ceasing for the good of the city. Thank you. with my broken toe those steps one more time. <laughs> but um, I can't thank you enough thank for your you. eloquence, your dignity, your grace, your love for this country, and uh, your, your ability to articulate with so many words I have to go look up. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that those of us here feel and believe. We are grateful to you and for honoring uh, our dear friend Jay Parker. Thank you. Um, I have to tell you um, that uh, um, Heritage uh, did not ask me um, to do this lecture. Uh, I insisted that they let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely true. Um, before I uh, open it up, and, and she has graciously agreed to answer uh, a few questions before she leaves, 
I got to tell a personal story. <laughs> so um, we wanted to escape Washington during, um, I think it was an, 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 an inaugural event. Inauguration. Yeah, that we just wanted to get out of town for. And uh, it was one of the coldest spells. Um, so much so that when we went down to historic Holly Knoll, the pipes were frozen. And so there were only the four of us, Dewey and Charles and Janice and I. Dewey and I decided we were going to leave and go check into the uh, Williamsburg Inn where we could get a proper bath and a warm meal. Charles and Janice decided, we're going to tough it out. And they literally, you know, going back and hearkening back to their childhood, I think y'all made that up, um, and would go down to the river every morning and scoop water out of the river. When I tell you this is one tough cookie... <laughs> And she never forgot her roots. Um, while I was ready to run off to the Williamsburg Inn, she and Charles decided that we would stay without water uh, and tough it out at Holly Knoll. What a woman. <laughs> okay, so we'll do one or two questions from the audience. Anybody? Okay, over here. Thank you. I am a fellow former Californian, and uh, I, I see my, my home state that I love so much go farther and farther down this, this road. And I'm just wondering if you have any idea of if there's any hope or, or maybe uh, some encouragement on, on maybe what can be done to our, our lovely state. <laughs> Well, I like to think that there, there is always hope, but I agree with Roger Scruton that um, judicious doses of pessimism are helpful. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, um, I, I don't see how, given um, the political dynamic in California, you're actually ever going to um, change that uh, before you know, some drastic collapse. But um, California is a beautiful state. Um, it will rebound. Um, I think the end is near, and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Over here, we have a question. Judge Brown, you've been on the governing board of a great university, one that really seems to have kept its principles and its standards. Do you have some advice for the nation and for colleagues elsewhere how they can begin to right the ship and maybe get it on a course that it can stay on? Um, you know, I don't know. But when I said earlier that um, this did not happen overnight, it did not happen overnight. It feels like that. But that is not true. Um, we have been sliding for at least 100 years. And uh, part of what's been happening is that we have simply given over the education of our children um, um, you know, to people who had this uh, jaundice and, I think, biased view of America. Um, and I'm, I can't tell you how painful it is for me to um, you know, listen to these uh, commentators who are now on TV with their, you know, their faces all aglow talking about how wonderful it is that our children uh, are so compassionate and desire socialism, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I mean, I, I think that's where it starts. We have lost um, several generations. We have to do what we can. Um, you know, they are doing what they can. They essentially run re-education camps as part of freshman orientation. Um, so we have to do likewise um, and try to find more opportunities, we have a few, um, where young people can um, at least be exposed to um, you know, what, what is real and what American ideals really are and what this country is really all about. But we need to start, as they are starting, in preschool. <laughs> so uh, you have to 
Get your children out of the government school, please. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, because when, when, when uh, C.S. Lewis says that about education will become propaganda, um, I think when he said that, people thought, well, that's just crazy. But now, look, you know, that is exactly uh, what, what we're dealing with. So uh, we have to start with education. Um, those of us um, who are um, senior citizens, uh, those baby boomers, uh, I'm one of them, uh, we have a lot to answer for. We have really messed up. We have let things go that we never should have let go. And we are at fault. And we have to start speaking the truth. And we have to stop being afraid. Hear, hear. <laughs> One last question. Even though you answered quite a bit in that last statement, Judge Brown, I appreciate what you're saying, Derek McCoy. I had the opportunity to uh, push your vote with Senator Frisch years ago. Um, with what you just said, as far as educationally with our kids, I get that. Um, I was going to ask the question of how do you insert in midstream some of us that might be in midstream to be able to still uh, objectively kind of insert into the dynamic that we currently have, plus as I'm sitting on a row with some budding young attorneys, uh, where, where do they go and how can they do some things as well? Well, you know, um, if you are seeking it, uh, there, there are certainly opportunities for that. There are lots of, you know, Claremont runs a, a wonderful program in fellowship. Um, even, you know, if you don't want to do that much, there are things like Prager U, uh, uh, because a lot of the young people, the millennials and younger, very attached to their technology. They're not going to read books when they, you know, um, <laughs> just not, <laughs> you know, not, you know, not that interested in something that requires long, uh, disciplined concentration, but you can feed them things in small doses. So take advantage of that. Um, for people who want seminars and things like that, they exist. Look for them. Uh, for those of you who are brilliant, start them. You know, <laughs> um, you know there are there are things um, that can be done. And I and I for one will say that it is so important for people who are involved in this struggle and who get very tired and who feel um, that they must be something strange and there's something wrong with them that every once in a while, just to have a little balm for the soul, you know? <laughs> just to be in the presence of other people who think as you do is really important. People really need that. So um, all of those things you can do in midstream. To follow up on that, and as a point of personal privilege with the last comment, uh, we have a young man here who is currently uh, on a fellowship in the office of the president here. And he has three choices of law school, Harvard, Yale, and Stanford. As a budding young conservative, A, which law school should he go to? And B, what advice would you give him going into law school in order to survive and come out still a conservative? Wow. <laughs> if I had the answer to that. Um, you know, um, I, you know, retirement would be golden. But, <laughs> um, you know, all of those are, are actually good law schools in, in, in this sense. Law is about um, often uh, where you get your credentials. And um, it makes a huge difference where you do that. Now, the problem is you have to run that gauntlet while you get it. Um, which, uh, you know, which will um, be in opposition to what you believe if you're a conservative. Um, and so the only thing I can suggest to you, I mean, all of those are good schools. None of them um, will be a bastion of conservatism. <laughs> um, and so you will have to seek your own opportunities to expand your knowledge in that way. One of the things that um, is being done for um, tenured professors, I think, could be done for students as well, um, which is to create networks of like-minded people, even though they may not be going to school with you. But just so you know, you are not alone. 
And when you are down and they're beating you up, you can call somebody. <laughs> you have a helpline. You can call and say, it's really bad today. Tell me something good, you know? Um, so I think those things um, can be helpful. It will not change um, that culture. But even some of these elite schools are, uh, a few people within those schools are beginning to see how bad it really is um, and how one-sided is the instruction that they're providing. And um, so there are, you know, little movements. There's a, Haight has something called the Heterodox Academy where they're trying to, uh, think about, you know, um, how do you toughen people up and how do you teach if you were only giving them one side, you know, of every issue. So, um, you know, there's hope. But, but as I think Jay Parker would say to you, it is up to you. You will have to be strong. If you are a patriot, you will have to go on being that, you know, in the face of ridicule and opposition. That's okay. You know, when I was small. Uh, I, I lived in an area where there was de jure segregation. Um, and I said, um, oh, the, you know, this is, life is unfair. And my grandmother said, yes, what's your point? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> and she said, okay, um, so you, so if you are going to do whatever it is, whatever job you want, you have to be twice as good. Um, be twice as good. No whining. Okay, so that's my answer. <laughs> here, here. Thank you. Isn't she amazing? And on behalf of the Heritage Foundation and the Gloucester Institute, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my husband, Charles, and I are honored, honored every year to host the Jay Parker Lecture Series. And uh, we are uh, grateful, grateful for your being here today to honor not only Jay, but to uh, honor you as well. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for coming.